All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. In this episode, our guests are Terrell Givens and Nathaniel Givens. They have teamed up to write a book called Into the Headwinds, Why Belief Has Always Been Hard and Still Is. I'm going to put a link to Amazon for this book in the description in the uh, on the YouTube channel here. Go and grab it. Terrell Givens is a senior research fellow at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute of Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. I'm a big fan of his. Until 2019, he was a professor of literature and religion at the University of Richmond, where he held the James A. Botswick Chair in in, uh, English. Nathaniel Givens, his son, is a thought leader in the Latter-day Saint community, writes several articles that have been published, and he's been a guest on this podcast twice. Not surprisingly, one of those episodes was on the topic of faith. This was a great discussion. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I think you will too. How would you define faith to begin with? Uh, I see faith as a suite of dispositions toward openness, uh, a recognition of the limitations of one uh, mode of knowing, which is that of logic or rationalism, uh, an openness to the fact that there are other ways of knowing, other layers of reality beyond the the purely material and immediate. Nathaniel, how about you? Um, So we usually have kind of two things in mind, like we all people, when we think about faith, um, one is just like ideas that you believe in. Um, And then the other is this idea of relationship. Um, And I think to really, you really need to put the two together when we're talking specifically about faith in God, um, that there are certain tenets that you're, uh, you're assenting. The one thing that I think is really important here though, is that it has to be a costly um, assent. Uh, A lot of people think they believe things um, and they might not actually believe what they think they do. That's a, a major topic that we, that we discuss in the book. So you have this idea that you're having a costly assent to a belief, to a proposition, but it's combined with an actual relationship and a kind of loyalty and a faithfulness. Um, and, and you kind of put those two together, I think is what we're doing. What do you mean? What do you mean by costly? Uh, it, it, it could be anything like paying tithing, right? Like that's not cheap, right? Um, or it could be, you know, facing um, unpopularity. Um, it could be, it's just making sacrifices is what it really comes down to. One of, the, one of the things that we talk about in the book is the difference between kind of hypothetical beliefs um, and practical beliefs. Um, so people tend to be very good at practical beliefs, um, things like how does physics work? And I don't mean like theoretically, but I mean, like if you drop an object, it falls, right? We learn that as children. And the reason we, we get pretty good with these practical beliefs is that if you get a practical belief wrong, you're going to kind of get schooled immediately by the universe that, that you, that you messed up. But when it comes to more theoretical beliefs and politics is a big one here, um, people's political opinions, they don't impose any costs. You can believe whatever you want. Um, and for the most um, you know, in most situations, your belief about politics, capitalism, communism, whatever it is, any ideology, it's not going to cost you anything. Those are costless beliefs. And as a result, people tend to have kind of weird beliefs when it comes to politics. Um, and, and the same kind of thing can be true of religion, um, that if your beliefs aren't causing you to take certain actions that have costs associated with them, you can kind of believe whatever you want. Um, And the costs, like I said, it could be financial when you're paying tithing, it could be social when you're believing something that's unpopular, or it could be, you know, much more significant. You know, you look at the scriptures and the examples of martyrdom, um, and sometimes you you, you pay the very highest cost. But the idea is that you don't know what you believe until you've started to pay a cost for that belief. Up until that point, it it could all just be theoretical. Okay. So you talk in the book a lot about rationalism and maybe it's what it lacks. And how you know we may we may search for our faith we may be going through a faith transition or some may call it a faith crisis we're trying to grapple with this this uh idea of what do i believe and how can i believe and typically we use rationality in a modern western mind to to try and move us forward in that journey where do we lack what la- what does rationality lack and and you know the roots of secularism uh we live in a very secular world how how can how can secularism what what does it lack for us to to be able to 
express a belief, to strengthen a belief, to strengthen a faith? So we're not against rationality. Um, rationalism, I would say, is the idea that rationality is sufficient. It's the idea that all you need is rationality, and that's where you get into a problem. Rationality is basically a very useful tool, um, but tools don't use themselves. They have to be put to a purpose, and who's going to provide that purpose, and who's going to use judgment about when which tool is appropriate. So it's really about synthesizing rationality with intuition, which is where we get um, moral, uh, our moral drive and our moral sense. Um, as well as as well as other factors. So it, it's not trying to take away; it's trying to add to rationality these other um, modes of of believing and of understanding and of interacting with the world. Carol, how would you how do you quantify intuition? Well, I don't know that it can, can be quantified, but I think in all of life's most important transactions, we're really operating on intuition, not on pure rationality. If you walk out of your place in employment and you see somebody in the street and they're abusing a child, beating a little child, you don't have to do a kind of rational calculation of what's at stake. You immediately respond on an intuitive gut level and you say, that's wrong, that's immoral. And you can create uh, logical or rational explanations that account for the nature and reality of evil. But that's all after the fact. Uh, choosing who you're going to marry or how you're going to, uh, to, to what causes you're going to devote your life. Those are all decisions that we generally make on the basis of, of gut level, instinctive, moral intuitions. And uh, we all validate those implicitly, if not explicitly. Now you go into a lot in the book about this, the divided self and how there's a lot more, uh, a lot more studies that have been done on, look, we don't, we don't behave typically necessarily out of just a rational uh, from a rational source within us, but there's also this intuitive source as you, you talk about. Um, how does that divided self work? I mean, how, how does that work with each other? How do you get to a point where you say, okay, my faith is comprised of a divided self. How do I bring rationality in on one end and, and this intuition on the other? Well, I think a, a great deal of the book is devoted to recent developments in cognitive science that make us uh, much, much more aware in these days of the extent to which all kinds of subconscious hidden processes are always at work in our mind, preforming our opinions and our ideas and our beliefs. And so part of what we're doing in this work uh, can be a little bit depressing at times. I mean, some people who have read it have have said, gosh, you seem to really restrict the sphere of moral agency. And we're saying, well, that's because the, the sphere of moral agency is more restricted than, than we often recognize. But it's always there. There's always a, a fundamental freedom, ultimately, to make life's most consequential decisions. But, you know, we've learned about things like cognitive bias and priming the pump and, and ways in which all kinds of, of uh, factors external to our conscious self are working uh, in hidden ways at, uh, at, at shaping and predetermining our inclinations and dispositions. So, so if someone's, let's say they're questioning their faith a little bit, how, how does this thought process about the divided self and intuition maybe give them a lifeline to some degree, maybe something they haven't thought about before? How, how does this add to moving through, say, a faith crisis or a faith transition? I would say that a lot of the problems that people encounter um, in a faith crisis or in a faith transition come from kind of a suite of, of bad expectations or bad assumptions. And so what we're trying to do in this book is, is reset the assumptions that are at play, the paradigms that, that is at play before people get to that moment of crisis. Um, and so when people can kind of understand, you know, how beliefs are formed, um, which is a big part of what we're talking about in the book, I, I think they have a much better opportunity to understand um, what is causing the problems? Where's the, the, the sense of, of, of struggle coming from? Where's the sense of, of stress coming from? And in, in part of it, it's just right in, in, in the subtitle of the book, right? It's like why belief has always been hard, right? So this is one of these fundamental expectations. If you understand that life is supposed to be hard, part of the reason we're here is to struggle. And, you know, this is a common message in, in, in general conference. This isn't anything new. And if you understand that faith is part of that, 
that we are here to learn and grow. And part of that learning and growth is through struggle. Um, I think that you can come to these moments where things don't seem easy to believe with, with a greater sense of calm and with, well, this isn't totally unexpected. This isn't like some horrible surprise. Um, there, there, there are good and bad reasons that something could be hard to believe. When we say something is hard to believe, right? Just again, common language. Sometimes what we mean is that seems really implausible. Um, and clearly that would be concerning if, if your faith seems implausible to you, like if it seems like to violate some, some rules, then that's something that you'd want to examine. But that sense of, of disbelief could also just come from social factors. Um, it could come from psychological factors. So let's kind of, it's, it's kind of a doubt your doubts, right? It's a question your questions approach. Um, so by laying this groundwork and kind of providing new expectations and a new paradigm, I think we're enabling people to be a little bit skeptical of their skepticism. Yeah, I think as as Nathaniel mentioned, one of the one of the features of our approach is to try to to cast secularism in many ways as a kind of boogeyman that that gets more credit and more blame than it deserves. Um, the, the the point is that you know first century Christians weren't a bunch of rustic rubes who were gullible enough to believe in the resurrection because that's what they were taught. Uh, it was just as hard to accept the premises of Christianity in the first century AD as it is today. And in fact, we're trying to go against the grain in suggesting, uh, as Nathaniel said, that faith is supposed to be hard and it's supposed to come with costs. And so we connect this to this, this, you know, this current obsession that the media and much of the public has with disaffiliation, right? The, the, the rise of the nuns. And, and part of what we're, what we're trying to suggest counterintuitively is that one reason why disaffiliation is so rampant is because faith has been made too easy. It doesn't bear many of the social and cultural costs that it did in the first four centuries of the Christian church. Uh, to just give one, one glaring example, <clears throat> to be a Christian at various times in the first four centuries meant that you were put, putting your very life at stake by being a Christian. Today, in the American political scene, for example, try to run for office without being a Christian, right? Good luck. To be a Christian in the political sphere now gives you cultural capital, whereas in uh, in, in early centuries it, it came inevitably at tremendous cost. So, as Nathaniel said, we believe that faith has to be costly, and much of the implicit costs of religious belief today uh, have disappeared. So, there it's, it's kind of ironic then. I mean, so we're <laughs> saying if you're saying it's too easy today to to believe it actually in a sense then is it makes it too hard to believe yeah it's like it's too easy to to believe in a superficial way and that superficial belief can get in the way of a deeper belief so it's kind of more about affiliation and conversion or one way to look at it um it's you know ever since for, you know rome adopted christianity as, a, as the official state religion so for the last you know 1600 years um, affiliation with Christianity in, in these parts of the world has, has come with a lot of bonuses. And so affiliation was easy. And that easiness of affiliation actually made a deeper conversion harder sometimes. Because if you think showing up at church, putting your name on the rolls, if you think that's conversion, then you take those steps, which are costless, which don't cost you anything. They don't require any deep sacrifice or any deep thought. You take those steps and you kind of think, okay, I'm done. I'm a Christian. Um, and it's it's the easiness of that superficial step that stops people from going to the deeper steps. You know, for those early Christians, again, if you're deciding, do I want to join this church that has these impossible beliefs about a man rising from the dead that is persecuted and not just persecuted, but, and this is probably almost more meaningful on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's ridiculed. Everybody thinks these guys are ridiculous. Do I want to join that? You're not going to take that step without some deep thought and some real commitment. And so when affiliation is costly, you're filtering for people who've really gone through that process of belief and they've really decided they're converted. But the easier affiliation gets, the easier it is for people and it, to just not even be challenged. And if they're not challenged, how are they going to grow that deeper commitment? How are they going to grow that deep conversion? That that kind of brings up a question, I think, about them. If we, if we think, you know, we've got a mostly Latter-day Saint audience here. If if that's true, then as as the church in the U.S., say, for example, has has grown and has been to some degree mainstreamed, right? And not quite there, obviously, but has been to some degree mainstreamed where there's more of a sense of belonging to the greater culture. 
Isn't that a problem then? Uh, I mean, if, and I mean that sincerely, it's, it seems to me that if, if, if culture is moving one direction here and we're not necessarily in, necessarily in agreement with that culture moving with everything, everything it represents, if, if the church were to move along with that, then that seems to me, based on what you're stating, and I believe that's true, that, that, that it's, it's much more difficult if you are moving along with that culture because there, there's less of a cost. And, and I think that there's less of a, that almost creates less of a purpose as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And there's, this, this isn't just speculation. There's actual, actually solid science, social scientific research that substantiates this view. Most of it was done back in the 1980s by Rodney Stark and his colleagues. And they developed this thesis about religion, successful religions having to maintain an optimal tension with the prevailing culture. So if the tension is too great and you just kind of become loonies, right, then you're just marginalized off. But if you're, if you know, and, and I remember experiencing this personally, right? I grew up back in the 70s and 80s when churches were experiencing rapid disaffiliation. And so they responded by, by, by making religious belief easier. I remember passing a church in New England once and it had a marquee outside and it said, come worship with us soft pews and no hell. <laughs> and we know because of the social scientific research that that, that is a, a recipe for disaster, right? You, you bring in rock bands and rock music. I knew a priest who offered potato chips and beer for the Eucharist to try to, to write appeal to this younger audience. If you completely reduce that tension with the prevalent culture, then people effectively are saying to themselves, well, if this isn't worth the sacrifice, then why would I commit myself to that cause? Uh, I remember a moving experience I had in graduate school where a, uh, a, a colleague related to me, he was, he was a devout Catholic. He was talking with a bunch of friends about Mormonism. And one of them said, man, I, I would never belong to a church that required 10% of my income. And the Catholic responded by saying, I would hate to think there's nothing in my life worth sacrificing sacrificing 10% for. And I think that captures beautifully the principle that we're, we're talking about here. Well, and it brings up the, 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 the principle of standing for something. And, and, and when, you, when you stand for something and, and the current continues to move beyond you, that, that creates, in many ways, I think, something that we are missing a little bit more today is it, it, it creates also a rallying call. Right to us to a degree of, of hey here's our banner here's where we're 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 putting the banner down and as everything else moves here we are separate from some of these things and 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 that does create a purpose and a rallying call for for people and I, I feel to some degree we're we're starting to lose that a little bit in the church in in the U S as 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 we become more and more mainstream so that's that's an interesting topic now. Height. You bring up Jonathan Height. I love Jonathan Height. Uh, read all of his stuff. Um, you've uh, you've got him talking about these two sides, and he uses the metaphor of the rider and the elephant. And you know, we usually think of ourselves, ourself, as the rider. It, it's our consciousness, and and the elephant is is kind of what we're actually directing, and and. I think it's a great metaphor because it may be the larger piece of us, right? That, that, that actually exists. How much of that self, that divided self is the writer and, and how much of it really is the elephant? I mean, we basically agree with height and, and, you know, it's not, it's not just height. He's summarizing a whole body of research from, you know, Daniel Kahneman and a whole bunch of others who've all, they all come up with their own terminology, which is kind of funny, Um, but they're all saying basically the same thing which is that most of your day-to-day activity, most of what you do on a day-to-day basis comes from the elephant. It comes from the unconscious. Um, it comes from the intuitive side. Um, and that the rider can access, can kind of override the elephant at any given point in time. Um, but that takes effort and the rider gets tired. Yeah, and the rider gets tired. And when that happens, the elephant takes control again. Um, and so to a rationalist, the first thing is, well, this is, you know, this is terrible news. You know, the, the, the writer should be, or well, first it's just denial. They think that the, they are the writer. Um, and then if they do accept this, then it's terrible news because the writer should be in control. And that's really a mistake because there's a lot of the best parts of us that come from that intuitive side. And so what we're really looking forward 
uh, here, and I think this goes along with what, with, with what Height says, is a synthesis. You know, you don't want to try to stamp out the elephant. Um, the elephant is the is, is you know, as my father mentioned just earlier, it's it's the it's the basis of moral intuition. That's where our, our our gut reactions, that's where courage comes from, that's where empathy comes from. There's a lot of really important work that the elephant does. Um, and there's also, you know, not more, not just moral stuff, but vision and a lot of other things. So the, the elephant is incredibly beneficial. The problem we get into is when we think we're the writer. And the elephant keeps making decisions, but we think the writer has made the decisions and we start rationalizing. We become separated from ourselves. We don't understand ourselves. We don't know our own beliefs. We start not understanding the, the, the actions that we're taking. And, and that's, that's kind of the, that's what we're trying to avoid. Nathaniel, give the example that you, you give in the book. Of yeah, this is, this is one of retirement plans, right. right. Yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite stories. Um, and it was just, so I was, I was talking with a friend, you know, we're both Latter-day Saints. This was many years ago. Um, and we were talking about the second coming as you do. Um, and, you know, he was very confident that the second coming was going to be, you know, within 20 years. Um, and this conversation took place, you know, 15 years ago, but anyways, I was kind of, kind of skeptical at the time. And I just, I said, okay, you, you're really, you're sure it's going to be within 20 years. Okay. Do you, do you contribute to your 401k? And he was just like, what? Like, like I just totally changed the topic. And he was like, well, well, yeah, I do actually. I've got this great company match and, you know, I'm putting in all this money. And I was just like, okay, how, what's your plan for getting the money out of the 401k? Cause we were both in our twenties, right? So if you're in your twenties and you're, you're sending a lot of money to your 401k, how are you going to, how are you going to get that back out before the world ends at the second coming? And it, he was just like, it had never, it had never occurred to him. Like those two like the, the religious theories and the financial theories, he'd never put them together. And it was like, he was like, wow, I, I, well, I don't know. And this is, this is what I mean about people thinking they believe things when they really don't. He really thought that he believed that the second coming was going to be in the next 20 years, but just looking at his actions, they didn't match what he thought he believed at all. And so this is an example of the rider merrily off, you know, thinking that he's in control, thinking that he's calling the shots and the elephant has taken him in a very, very different direction. And if you don't reconcile those two things, then how can you really be said to be in charge of your own life? It's like you're a passenger on a boat and you think you're the captain. So go ahead, Terrell. No, no, that's not. Well, I was just going to say, so how much, how much of one's belief is what you profess and how much is what you do? So this is where we talk about this idea of the theory of revealed beliefs. Um, and basically, if you can't deduce the belief from the action, it doesn't really exist. Or you should at least just call it provisional, right? You should write it down in pencil because you don't know. Um, I don't want to say somebody doesn't believe. I just want to say it's, 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 a, it's a maybe belief. You don't know if it's real or not until you have to make actions based on that belief and that are costly. And that's when you know. And I, to be honest, I don't know if that's when the belief is created or if that's when the belief is discovered. You know, it's some combination of that. And I'm not sure. And it's probably different for different people in different circumstances. But until you can reveal that belief through costly action, it's just hypothetical. So, so is belief then the belief is associated with the elephant? Or, or is belief associated with the writer? Because in you, this case, you're saying, look, the elephant is overriding the writer. The writer is uh, saying one thing and directing it one way, and it's going another way. Real belief comes from the elephant, but all of our explanations come from the writer. And that's the problem. Because the writer is making up these explanations, but doesn't even necessarily know what the real belief is. Um, now, if you can bring the elephant and the writer together, if you can synthesize them, if you can come to know yourself better and, and integrate those parts, then your explanations for your beliefs, your hypothetical beliefs, and your actions, your actual beliefs, they'll come together. You'll, you'll, you'll get that unity. And that's what you want. You know, um, Socrates famously said, the unexamined life is not worth living. And I think what he meant is that if you don't examine your life, it's not really yours. It's that process of examining your life that allows you to take ownership of your life and say, this is my life. I made my decisions. Right. And, in order, and that is the process of bringing the elephant and the writer together. It's, it's the process of, of, of unifying them. If you don't do that, then it just goes back to what I said earlier. You're, you're the passenger on the boat that thinks you're the captain. You're making all these choices. Um, you've got these beliefs, but they're coming from the elephant and you don't even know what they are. And a lot of those beliefs might not be great. It might be, you know, if I buy enough stuff, I'll be happy. And so you keep 
working harder, making more money, buying more stuff. Now, if you ask the person, do you believe buying stuff will make you happy? They might not say yes, because you're talking to the writer and the writer thinks they have a whole different set of beliefs. So you've got these actual beliefs encoded in the, the behavior that the elephant is guiding. And then you've got these hypothetical beliefs that the writer has and they don't meet, they're separate. And if, this all, if this all sounds complicated, it, it's because it is. <laughs> and one way of answering your question is to say, we, we don't know. There isn't any easy way in self-examination of knowing. So I, I, I think part of what our book is intended to do is to unsettle uh, and, and to encourage people to just be more humble about their self-knowledge and, and more reflective, uh, you know, just as, you know, in the famous instance of, you know, I don't know if I would be willing to give my life on behalf of, you know, my belief or a principle or a friend. Uh, and most of us don't know. Uh, and so part of, of what we are, are, are preaching here, I, I think, is what uh, Nathaniel and others have called epistemic humility. It's about uh, recognizing the limits of self-knowledge, um, and having a, a kind of openness uh, about belief and about our own self-awareness. And uh, our, our, our book is an attempt to just make us more self-aware about the difficulties and the challenges and the problems associated with religious commitment and belief. But to, 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 to insist in the end uh, that, as, as Nathaniel said earlier, that we should doubt our doubts as much as we doubt our beliefs and that there is good reason to forge ahead against the headwinds. And I think there's a positive message there too. If you don't know what you believe until you have to sacrifice for it or until you're, you're faced with challenges, I think that's a healthier approach to the challenges in your life. Because when those challenges come, it's like, okay, here's, here's a moment. Here's a moment where I can find out what I believe. You know, let's, let's see what's really going on. You, you begin to see more of the positive aspects of the trials and the challenges that we face. So it's kind of like a bad news and then comes the good news. The bad news is you don't know what you believe. The good news is you're going to find out through the challenges in your life. That's when you're going to have the opportunity to discover your beliefs, to define your beliefs. Um, and I just think it's a, it's a healthier approach to, to, to the difficulties that we all face in our lives. Now, of course, we'd all want to feel like, okay, we've got some control about what we believe in, right? So, so if there's this intuition that is coming up and perhaps it's when the rubber hits the road that we actually discover what we believe based on our action in that that trial tribulation or choice that is given to us um, can i just can i just say here I, i'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt but but here's where i would invoke the definition that nathaniel gave of faith at the very beginning because i think it's really relevant in this regard if we think of of faith both as faithfulness commitment to an individual in our case to jesus christ and faith is our ascent to a series of propositions, then we ought to feel more comfortable uh, being rooted in that faithfulness and saying, look, re regardless of the vicissitudes of my life, regardless of the, the confusion and the uncertainty into which I might be thrown by this or that datum that comes to, to, to my consciousness, I don't have to call into question my fundamental commitment to Jesus Christ. And so if we, if we make that distinction clear, then I think we're able to negotiate faith challenges much in a, in a much more healthy and productive way. We can recognize that what the Old Testament refers to as faith is really about a steadfast commitment to Christ. And increasingly, we have shifted, I think, in unhealthy ways to thinking about faith as ascent to a whole series of intellectual propositions which should be subject to continual re-examination, renegotiation, reformulation, because a testimony should be organic in that way without calling into question the non-negotiable commitment. Yeah, so a relationship with God is, is really what we're eventually focusing on here. I, th I, I think that's right. If I'm looking at faith, I, I, think, I, I think it is trust. I, I think it, it's a relationship type of, uh, uh, well, it's a noun, but it's, it's a verb as well. And it's, do you trust? Do, what do you trust? And, and I think maybe if you're put into a certain circumstance uh, where you may not know what you have faith in, then maybe that comes up, that, that, that's where you learn what you really trust, I think. And, uh, uh, and again, that trust is, is, is an element, it's a characteristic of relationship that is, I believe, impossible to fake. 
It's like, you know, we can, we can, I can have trust in you to a certain degree. We don't know each other real well. So I, I can say something, I can profess something, but internally, I know the level of trust I have. And I'm probably going, I'm probably going to behave based on that, that, that level of trust that's there. Now, intuition then, what is the intuition? Because if I've got the elephant, and you know, I, I keep talking about the elephant in the room here. But what if I've got the elephant that is going to arise in certain circumstances? I, I kind of want to know what that intuition is. Where does that come from? Is this based on my life experience that, that's brought in from a religious standpoint? Is it the spirit that is going to be dictating things to me as well? Uh, is it some type of uh, hey, I'm created in the image of God? And this is inherent in me as what I have already with the light of Christ. Where Where is this intuition coming from that is going to tell me what I believe? I think it's a combination of all the things you just mentioned. Um, I, I do believe the evolutionary paradigm is useful here as a starting point. Um, because then you can see that the, the elephant is basically what a large part of the elephant is what we have in common with all other animals. And so a lot of what the elephant is concerned with are things like, am I hungry? Am I tired? Am I in danger? Is there a threat? And with human beings in particular, the elephant is absolutely obsessed with status. Um, and that's why, you know, so much of what we do throughout the day and even our beliefs, a lot of the times reflect these status games that we play. We all know that there are certain beliefs that correlate with high status in our society. And so the elephant is going to want to go towards those beliefs or expressions of those beliefs because, hey, there's some status here. So I think you, you kind of start with this basic level of just biology. Um, but there's no hard line between biology and culture, between biology and, 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 and society. So some of the other things that you were talking about, like the assumptions, the ways that I'm raised, the preconceptions that I get, none of us start thinking about this stuff when we're two days old, right? We start thinking about this stuff at the earliest, maybe a little bit when we're eight, 10, 12, but really in the, in the teen years. By the time you're a teenager, you've learned a language, you've learned a culture, you've got a ton of these beliefs that you've just inherited without even realizing it. So all of that stuff is in there too. Um, it's all it's all mixed together. Uh, yeah, I, I think these simplistic dichotomies between body and spirit or emotion and spirit don't serve us well, right? I mean, Paul said, whether in the body or out of the body, I couldn't tell, right? There are times when language and, and our, our labels fail us. And I think the point is we just have to be open to the plenitude of ways in which we know things. And uh, it's a it's a broad spectrum. It's interesting you bring that up because that, that was the next point I was going to bring up. It, it, as I read your book, I, I have this, I have these these principles that that for for gospel study um, that I call interpreters, and one of those is the higher and the lower laws. And in, in my mind, I see you know the higher law governed by the Melchizedek priesthood, the lower law governed by the Aaronic priesthood, and to me, the Aaronic priesthood is the self; it's the priesthood of the individual. And the Melchizedek priesthood is the priesthood of the group or the community. That could be marriage, family, Zion, etc. So when you bring that example up of, uh, of Paul, I didn't know if it was in the spirit or not. It, 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 it's interesting to me when you really get into the scriptures, how much of these scriptures are rooted in what appears to be more of a subconscious revelation through visions, dreams, et cetera, that come into the prophets. It's not like it's they're going to your reason. These are things that are um, brought in, you know, spiritual language of symbolism. Just read the book of Revelation, right? It's, it's, it's all of this symbolism that is coming into your subconscious, it seems to me, that is through symbolism that you're supposed to then try and articulate through reason and and your your skills in communication is is that intuitive uh side is 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 the subconscious more a spiritual side and 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 the uh uh the reason side is a little bit more of the individual. I mean, I mean, you look at the look at the tree of life, right? The, or the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You, you have a decision there by Eve to make a choice, and 
bring in, I believe, the law and to be able to then make conscious choices, decisions based on this is good and this is bad. And, and, and so you kind of have this fall into a lower law of, of decision-making and conscious uh, consciousness that is uh, uh, based in commandments and, and, and choice and agency. Is, is, is intuition more the spiritual side? Well, uh, I, I don't know that it, that is always reliably the case, but I do think one way to, to address your question is to point to the plethora of genre in the Doctrine and Covenants. I mean, think, think about the fact that we, we've canonized the Doctrine and Covenants, we sustain it as scripture, as the word of God, and yet it includes revelations in the voice of God, it includes documents in the voice of Joseph Smith, it, it includes right statements of belief, it includes proclamations, it includes excerpts from letters. Yes, so I, I think the plethora of genre that we find in the Doctrine and Covenants suggests that the Spirit operates at, at, at a variety of levels of consciousness, right? It, it apparently is at work when we're writing letters, it can be at work when we think we are communing directly with God, it can be at work when we are composing a historical document, because all of those genre constitute uh, a, a book that we canonize and revere as scripture, uh, bearing the traces of God's inspiration. So secularism as a whole, then, do you find that this is the main problem? Is this the biggest issue with faith, with people that, you know, we again, we, we're, we're entering into this very interesting time, I think. To me, we're moving out of a modern world, and, and we're moving into a postmodern world. And, and, and I see a pendulum moving from uh, uh, something that would be more based in the metaphysical and maybe life experience um, to moving into then science. And, and you give the example of uh, uh, Isaac Newton and, and his writings and kind of the, the two sides that he has there focused on really Christianity and, and, and then a little bit of science. And, and then, you know, you get into Kant right away from after that, where he's pushing against the metaphysical and moving more into something that we might be drawing from coming in through the continental uh, uh, philosophy that, that's based a, little, a lot more on reason than it is on, say, our intuition on this. Um, are we moving more into that back? Is that pendulum swinging at all based on this, these new studies that you're bringing up in the book? Well, Nathaniel, correct me if, if you see this differently, but I think one of the points that we're trying to make is that uh, there isn't a kind of purely linear development of, sci of, of science or the scientific method, that uh, technology and refinements of scientific practice have, have been enhanced. But there has always been a mix of the intuitive, uh, the, the, the mystical, the, the aesthetic, uh, the creative, and the, the, the rigorous scientific so I don't know that we're we're retreating as much as I sense that there is a growing awareness that the promises of, of the scientific method have been overstated and uh, that most good scientists and philosophers alike recognize that, uh, that, that the scientific method itself does not have a monopoly on our access to understanding of the cosmos or the self. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that secularism is the problem. Um, I just think it's a manifestation of of kind of what's going on here. But I would not see us as moving kind of forward into postmodernism. I see us regressing, um, and and this is actually kind of apparent in what's happening to the institutions of science. Uh, if we look around us today, they're becoming increasingly politicized. And when scientific institutions are politicized, they're no longer about science. Um, we're basically recreating paganism um, is, is, is a pretty good way to look at it. Um, and ultimately, it's to the detriment of reason and to the detriment of rationality. And some of that anti-reason and anti-rationality is coming in the guise of scientific language and even from scientific establishments. But I really think we're just seeing the same fundamental problems. You know, when we when we talk about the elephant and the writer, that is a, a modern um, uh, analogy based on very contemporary research. We've got all this research um, from the late 20th and, and early 21st century, but the basic ideas that we're talking about are ancient. And that's why I can also quote Socrates and, you know, saying the unexamined life is worth living and say that he was talking about basically the same things. So, yeah, we, we, we see the rise and the fall of these, of these attributes um, and, and 
the, the last one I'll just mention here is really humility. I don't think people talk about epistemic humility enough, especially when it comes to science. There's really no such thing as a scientific method. Um, and any serious scholar of, of science will, or the philosophy of science will agree with you. Uh, we'll agree with that. But there is this idea of the scientific attitude. And the scientific attitude is basically one of reverence for data um, that we're going to go out there. We're going to try to gather like quantifiable objective data. And then we're going to subject our beliefs to that data. What you're really saying when you say that is we're going to be humble. That's really what it's about, right? We're going to take our beliefs, our attitudes, our ideas, our theories, and we are going to subject them to what we see in the world, to experimentation. And this attitude is really a fundamentally an attitude of humility. And when you retreat from that, and when you start to dictate your scientific beliefs based on ideology or politics, it doesn't matter what they are. Another, another, way, of, uh, another way of saying what's happening is that you're, you're sacrificing humility in lieu of pride. And so I think we can reinterpret what's happening in our society right now with secularism um, away from kind of something novel and that this is a new 21st century problem and that, you know, these are all these new advances. No, no, this is just humility and pride going through a cycle again. And when we were humble, science flourished because we had all these tools and we subjected ourselves to, to, to objectivity and to reason and to data. And we learned and, and, and science benefited. And now that we're, we're sacrificing that scientific attitude, we're becoming prideful, we're regressing. And that scientific attitude that is when it's in uh, hyper mode is you might call scientism and you cover scientism there. Here's what you talk about in your, in, in, in part two of the book on scientism quote, we are almost ready for a new valuation of faith. One that moves us beyond the false choice between blind belief in our intuitions on the one hand and a blind trust in rationalism on the other. First, however, we must deal with the most potent incarnation of the rationalist delusion, scientism. How big of a problem? Define scientism and then and then tell me how how big of a problem do you think scientism has been for those that struggle with faith? So science, I just kind of just defined as this attitude of humility towards data. Scientism is kind of the opposite of that. It's a corruption of that. Scientism is the idea that we can take the trappings of science and any question that is worth answering, we can answer with these tools, that there's nothing outside of science. Um, usually that comes with kind of this materialistic perspective. And so that's, that's what we mean by scientism. It's this, it's this kind of triumphalist narrative that we can do it on our own. All we need is science, or at least the trappings of science. And that's going to let us answer every question that there is. Um, and obviously this is, this has a huge impact on, on kind of faith crises and problems today. Um, yeah, I, I just don't, again, I just, I don't think it's something new. I think it's the return of pride, but this is the guise that pride takes in a 21st century industrial educated society. It takes the guise of scientism. So yeah, I think, go ahead, Terrell. Sorry, we, we, we both agree that scientism is not a problem with most practicing scientists. <laughs> it's more of a problem with the pseudo intellectual crowd who, you know, where a little learning is a, is a dangerous thing and culture more broadly defined. Yeah. Okay. So you move on here in this section on science and intuition and quote, in contrast to the myth that science is a wholly rational pursuit, science has always had two sides, magical and mechanical. What do you mean by magical and mechanical? And again, how does this play in someone's faith?